Hello, hello, everybody. We'll give everybody a couple minutes to, to get, get on, on board here. Welcome, welcome. Alex, where are you today? I am just outside of Annapolis, Maryland. That is that is home for me. So you're up there in the cold, right? Is it has it, has it warmed up up there? Um, it did. You know what? It got to up to 70 degrees last week, and then the next day it was like 28. Yeah, it was, it, was that way. Was it Sunday? I guess it was a really nice yeah. day, here, and then it got cold. Maybe yeah, it was, it was like and yeah. yesterday we got a little <laughs> bit of snow too, like briefly. Oh, so. No, you know, like, I, we, we saw snow about three times this year, which is about normal for us. Where's everybody else coming in from, though? I see some familiar faces. I know a few of you guys and where you're at, um, but a lot of new faces out here today. So that's that's always fun. Welcome. I see Dallas, Dallas Texas. Texas. It's not cold there. It only got cold there once and it made national news. I was there a couple weeks ago and it was cold. Was it? Yeah, last we'll week. Be, actually. I'll be there in about two months. We're doing a, a, a Chris Weiser event out that way. There you go. So, Detroit, it's a roller coaster. Yes. New Zealand. That sounds like that's the that, that wins the uh the most original New Zealand. Yes. Like more fun. Enjoying the snow in Iowa. <laughs> well, if you're enjoying it, I guess I can't make my moving truck joke. <laughs> all my family's from Michigan and I tell them all, you know, that moving trucks leave Michigan every day. At this point, you're there by choice. So I'm not a fan. Not a fan at all. Hey, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to get anybody from Michigan mad. I don't know. Right, right. No, it's okay. My whole family's up there. They're already mad. <clears throat> so that's fine. I, I'm polarizing. Like apparently, living in New York City is polarizing enough because I, when I talk to people at trade shows, they ask me where I live. I say New York City. They go, Oh no, I'm sorry. Or they go, Oh wow, I love it so much. Like there's never a, like, Oh okay. That's funny. I have to pretend I live somewhere civilized, so I say Annapolis, but it's really 20 miles away. And I have to drive through civilization to get there. Like I'm on a little island in the middle of nowhere with, you know, like six people and a goat. Like mm. there's just, there's, there's nothing where I am. So uh, we have to drive 30 minutes to get to, to a, uh, an actual Home Depot or a Lowe's. That's how, how far wow. out we are. So, and I like it. I, it gets me away from people, but um, all right. So let's get, let's get kicked off. Um, sure. We're, we're going to jump into, uh, I guess I've got my screen sharing already. So let's, uh, let's get going. Um, we got some, some little goals to, to get addressed here today. We're going to talk about uh, what it's like to talk to end users about cybersecurity. I assume most of you are here because you know this is miserable. Uh, it's just not an easy one. And when Jimmy picked this as a topic, I went, people are going to care about that. So, so let's go talk about it. Um, hopefully today we're going to get a few things tackled. Um, we're going to talk about the challenges that MSPs have when they're, when they're selling cyber. Um, we know it's not easy. We know end users um, don't speak the same language. So there, there's always some barriers there. Um, so we'll talk about how to have that discussion and uh, what the folks who are having real success selling cybersecurity are doing today that's really moving the needle. Um, we'll talk about how to use risk assessments to communicate cybersecurity and cybersecurity standing. And uh, we'll give you guys a short intro to both Lifecycle Insights and Quick Pass. So uh, with that, let's jump in and I'll let, uh, let Jimmy explain, uh, introduce himself. I uh, share sure. my name is Jimmy Hatzel. I'm the director of marketing uh, at QuickPass. I uh, have a background in cyber, a background in IT. I've ran IT before. I uh, worked for about a you know small, medium-sized business before getting into the sales and marketing side of things. Um, I worked for Scout Cybersecurity in my last role, which was recently acquired by Barracuda Networks. Uh, there I ran um, marketing as well. So, you know, sort of a unique background and I started in IT. Uh, I went to school for cybersecurity. So I, I have a strong background in cyber as well. And then moved into the sales and marketing side of things, uh, which is which is a nice place to be. But it also really helps me because in my role now at QuickPass and in my roles previously at Scout, a lot of what I did was helping MSP sell cybersecurity and helping position it and communicate it. Um, so I have a, a unique advantage there and and it's fun because i get to you know talk to msps all the time <laughs> it's funny because growing up i thought i wanted to be a computer programmer my mother was a computer programmer i took some basic classes in like second grade um all the way up through college i thought i was going to be a computer programmer um one semester of COBOL and rpg and that was off the table i dropped out <laughs> um went back to college a couple more times um but what i wound up in was was really just a career salesman um, I was always very tech savvy, very into technology. And uh, about 18 years ago now, I bought a little break fix mom and pop computer shop. Um, 
that evolved along with everybody else in the industry. 2008, 2009, we adopted managed services. We bought this little product called LabTech from this bunch of guys in a basement out in Ohio before anybody knew who they were. Um, we, start, we started doing MSP work. Um, so, you know, it was the, the thing that got me was um, I was into it because I got to solve problems. I got to fix things that made people excited. Um, what I realized way too late in that journey was that that was the salesman in me being satisfied by helping somebody solve a problem. And I really wasn't an IT guy or a technology guy. And I was good enough to be dangerous, but not good enough to be good. I spent a lot of years surrounding myself with smarter people than me uh, running the MSP. And then um, one day somebody came to me and said, I've got a, a group of developers and we're looking for a problem to solve. Have you got anything? And it just so happened that that was the day that I had spent seven and a half hours cobbling together spreadsheets to try and make QBR documentation for my biggest customer. And I said, you know, I have a sign over my desk that says, if you have to do it twice, automate it. And I do this by hand every single quarter and it's miserable. So um, that launched Lifecycle Insights. We've started to build that business analytics and, and VCIO platform. Uh, now we're expanding into customer success and, and enlarging those opportunities they have with your existing customers. So now I spend my life doing kind of what Jimmy was talking about in his former role, which is helping MSPs get their sales dialed in, helping them get that QBR process dialed in, teaching them what a QBR looks like that isn't a slimy sales pitch, but really get your, your customers excited to come back. So that's kind of where I've spent the last uh, two years uh, I guess I sold the MSP about 18 months ago now. So still still recovering, if, as I like to say. So with that, let's kind of jump in, though. Um, you know, Jimmy, you were uh, you, you, you brought this topic to me and I went, yeah. this one's fun. This is exciting to me. You know, um, selling security is hard. It's just it's, it's hard. Right. I can't put my finger on a dollar value that it makes my company. I can't ROI security. Right. The, the only ROI on security is zero. We didn't get breached. Nothing happened. Life is good, right? Um, you've got a lot of folks out there talking about it. You know, Jennifer Bleem just put out a book, Simplified Cybersecurity for MS sale, or for MSP Sales. It's called The Secret Formula to Closing Cybersecurity Deals Without Feeling Slimy. And that's kind of one of the number one pushbacks I get from MSPs is I feel my, my customer feels like I'm only there to sell them something. It feels like a hard sales pitch every time we go to have these talks. And I've got to find a way to get it in there and, and make it work. But then you've got other consultants out there like Chris Weiser, who says, and, and this guy's got thousands of followers. If you look at his Facebook group, I mean, he's, he's very, very, very well outspoken in the space about, um, you know, this message that every client needs the full cybersecurity stack. We've got to lead with risk. We've got to talk about these things. Um, so give me your two cents on it because, you know, there's people are all over the place. Lead with risk. Don't feel, feel slimy. Use some FUD. Uh, you know, try not to, to overwhelm your customer. Where's Jimmy sick? Yeah, I think it's all based on discovery and, and like these conversations will come up through, you know, really good discovery questions. So I always tell people you, you don't like, you want to be like the concerned friend who is asking someone to go to the doctor. And, you know, you're, you're not like, you're like, Hey, maybe you should get that, you know, maybe you should get that checked out. And that's sort of like the, the, um, you know, I had an image you, there of, you know, the guy pointing in the corner of the dusty server, like, hey, maybe you should get that thing checked out. Yeah, yeah like, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, you might have some concerns there. And, yeah. and that sort of transitions into when someone's like, like actually willing to listen a little bit, because if they're not willing to listen at all, you're trying to get it, it, foot in the door or whatever, you're trying to have start the conversation about cybersecurity when it's, when it's coming from that like concerned friend. Um, and, and they are your clients. So this should be easy to do because they're your clients. They're people, you know, in the community, they're uh, referrals of people and you genuinely don't want them to get hacked. Like, I don't want anyone to get hacked. Even right. like, you know, my worst enemies or whatever, like that is a nightmare. I don't support hackers and I want people to have better security. So when you're coming from this mindset of like, I genuinely am concerned about you. Um, like, let's, let's talk about it and let's break it down. That that's a much, you know, that's an easier, that's a way to, to avoid that. Like, you know, jumping right into uh, the salesman type, right. um, you know, like box. Um, but, but, but once you, um, once you get there and start having that conversation, it shifts from the concerned friend to like, almost like a doctor almost. And we'll, you know, we'll get into this with, with, uh, assessments and everything, but, you know, I, 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 I'm happy to, to break down a lot of the questions that, that I ask or recommend people ask. Um, but, you know, 
throw it back to you a little bit. And, with... Well, to that point, if anybody's got questions, feel free to stick them up in the in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, this is we don't consider it interruptions. These are this is definitely participation around here. But um, you know, to your point, discovery really helps set the table, right? It really helps us figure out where the customer is, what the status quo looks like. Um, discovery feeds a risk assessment which lays it out for the customer in black and white. One of my favorite questions about this is, you know, now that we've identified some risk that exists in your environment, what do you want to do about it, right? And kind of put it back on your customer. And they're going to go, well, I'm not really, I'm not the expert. Um, that's kind of why I have you here, uh, which, which is great. Then they're, they're, they're giving you that position of authority and you can come back at it with, you know, some, some gentle recommendations instead of what feels like a, a sales pitch, right? Um, I always run the risk assessment and then come back to the customer and say, hey, you know, you scored like this over here on our risk assessment. And uh, I'm not really happy with that. You're only aligned with 60, 70% of our best practices. If you signed up with us, we'd move the needle and we'd get you scoring over here somewhere. And we'd erase all the risk between the score you have today and the score you would have when you come to work with us. And that leads me to, I've got good news and bad news for you. And they go, well, what's that? Well, the good news is you're getting exactly what you're paying for with your current provider. Well, what's the bad news? You're getting exactly what you're paying for with your current provider. And you need to be buying more cybersecurity, right? And that, that opens the door for me to have that conversation with them about, there's an expense to solving for cybersecurity. And I don't want to come in here and push a sale on you, but you have to understand you're getting what you're buying today. And to move the needle, you really need to spend more money or do things differently or, or address this in a different way. So I think there's ways to have that conversation, depending on your personality. Not everybody is a, is a little bit of a, of a uh, I have an aggressive sales style, we'll say. Um, not everybody can make those comments, but when you can, and or if you can't, you have to find a way to get the same message across that, um, you know, Mr. Customer, you may be understanding and that may be leading to the result that you're getting today, right? $45 a seat, $65 a seat, doesn't solve for cybersecurity. Yeah, and it, it like at, at the end of it, and you know, you made me think of this. Um, there's two there's two real <clears throat> questions that you need to get a yes to, right, to get a sale. One, they need to actually understand that they have a problem, and agree that it's a problem. Cyber is a problem for them, so yep. that's through all your discoveries, the assessments, all of that. That's this problem for them. They they can agree that cyber is a problem in general, but if they don't think it's a problem for their business. It doesn't matter. So you have to make it relevant. And, and so how do you make it relevant? To, how do you make it relevant to their business? Yeah. So so the biggest thing, the biggest mistake, I think, um, is people assume they know what people care about protecting. And it's not always what you think. I've been in these meetings so many times. I've been on with partners selling to their end users. I've been uh, in somebody buying security. I've worked for um, a company selling directly security. And, and when you're talking to someone, whether that's a business owner uh, who knows nothing about IT at all, or someone who's worked in IT for years, you're not, you, you'll make assumptions on what data they actually care about protecting, but it's not always right. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. You can talk to uh, like, like, a, like a hospital, right? Or, or a medical provider or something. Yeah. You, one, like me, I might assume that what they care about protecting the most is their patient data, um, you know, the PHI, their employee records, things like that. One would hope they care about those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm sure they do. But if I don't spend the time on discovery and don't ask them about their business initiatives, what their biggest areas of growth are, things like that, and really get to understand their business, I won't know that they have a medical research division that brings in the majority of their revenue. And they're really concerned about protecting that. And if I bring a security stack around, you know, layered security around that data and that information, it completely changes the conversation from, oh, you know, you need endpoint protection, you need blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's really important. Like I go into these meetings and, and I even, you know, like I tell people everywhere, you should be talking to them, having a business conversation about security. You should be, you know, starting out, what are your three biggest business initiatives this year? You know, what are you looking to accomplish? What, why, why are we meeting today? Why do you want to talk about cybersecurity? Um, and, and really like, you got to get to understand it. And even like, you have to prepare for these meetings. You have to prepare for sales meetings. You do your research and everything, but it's better to ask them. So you can say things like, listen, you know, I know you have about 40 employees. We've been working with you for a while. Um, I know that you, you all do X, Y, and Z, you know, you make widgets, the widget factory. 
Um, but you know, it, it would really help me. I always just like to do this with, with my clients as a refresher. Can you just take me through your business? You know, what you do, what your mission is, what your vision, why you started it, all of that. And it changes the dynamic where you're having a conversation, right? About risk and about business and about them. Cause that's what they want to talk about and not about, Oh, there's some hacker that's going to come through and need to buy this product. Well, you, you go from fear-based selling, right? To protecting what's important to them. And in the process, you took five, 10 minutes, whatever it is, and let them talk about themselves, yeah. right? And business owners are proud human beings, right? They've got their blood, sweat, and tears in their business. CEOs, COOs, CFOs, they didn't get to that job by being underachievers and not working hard. So they want to talk about their achievement. They want to talk about what they've built. They want to tell you about it. Um, and if you can turn some of that around and use it to help guide them towards pro uh, protecting the thing that's important to them, there's a lot of value there. The one thing you said that, that jumped out to me only because I literally just heard it on a conversation yesterday was goals. And two of our most mature partners at Lifecycle Insights, and we have about 500 partners. So this is, you know, the top two partners we have probably as far as maturity and, and evolution of our process. Um, we're talking about how they address goals with their customers and that they're not, the goal is not cybersecurity. The goal is to open a new office, to grow, the, to grow sales by 15% to move to the cloud so everybody can work from Starbucks, you know, whatever those goals are, they're, they're typically not, I want to buy layers of cybersecurity defenses and put myself in a better place, right? <laughs> um, that, that's, that's not their goal, even though it might be your goal. And so, you know, where we can make the argument or at least explain to our customer how layers of security and additional protections enable that goal that they have, all of a sudden we're supporting them and not trying to sell them something. I think that's really important. And, and when I heard those two partners uh, talk about it in a very mature fashion yesterday, I went, that's great messaging. And I have to remember that. And I think we're actually going to bring them on at some point and let the two of them kind of coach a bunch of our partners um, because it was such a great conversation. Yeah. I mean, like just, just thinking about like positioning it when you get to, you know, right before the pricing conversation, you're going through the assessment, you're, you're about to get to the awkward period where you have to ask them to buy something. And the conversations like, listen, Alex, you know, I, I, I want you to achieve your goals. I want you to open that new office. I want you to hit that new revenue number. You've been, you've been trying to hit. And, and I, you know, I don't want you to have to think about it and cybersecurity. I want to take that problem completely off your plate so you can focus on what you're doing. So these these are my recommendations. And this is what I think that we should do for your business. So you can be successful. Like that's a totally different conversation than like buy this or you're going to get hacked and it's, it's going to be hard. Right. There, there's no fear in for your business. I'd like you to do this so that you yeah. can be successful. Right. That is supportive versus fear and uncertainty and doubt and all the stuff they, they throw into the FUD factor. Uh, and I'm kind of over the FUD thing, right? If you're, if you're not fearful in this day and age, you're not paying attention. If you still have uncertainty, you're probably not paying attention because you're probably going to get beat at some point. We better have these layers of security in there to make sure that when you do get beat, they only get so far. Um, you listen to the smartest guys in this space. You listen to, you know, Wes Spencer and Ryan Weeks and, uh, you know, all these guys talking about the assumed breach mentality. We have to be ready when the employee clicks on the email. We have to have those layers in place to make sure that the breach only goes so far. We can protect the environment and, and make sure the customer's left in a better place. And but to your point, that doesn't have to be a scary conversation. Uh, and it's, it's, it's genuine too. Like I, I know MSP business owners and people who work in sales and MSPs is generally smaller businesses. Yeah. There's some big national ones out there for sure, but it's generally, and it's working with small and medium sized businesses It's working with the actual owners. It's people in your community. It's people, it's, it's the people that it's the backbone of your own community. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, like you can be genuine in sales. Like it's totally doable and possible. And you're helping people and aligning your business practices with helping them achieve, you know, their goals and, and helping where you can, the area, you know, it cybersecurity, right? Like this is, it's, it's, it's not just it, you're helping people. And that's why I like being in cyber because it's, it, I genuinely think that you it's, know, it's why I like being in sales. It's why I like, enjoyed selling technology solutions because I was taking pain away from people who weren't tech savvy. Um, you know, at Lifecycle Insights, our, our clients, our customers, they're, they're having success because 
we're moving to the next level with the conversation, right? With our existing clients, we're talking about budget, we're talking about strategic initiatives and goals and things like that. Um, it, we're removing surprises and taking away the knock, knock, I need 20 grand because Windows 10 is going to die, right? Um, you know, and, and I sold that way. Knock, knock, Windows 7 is dead. I need $43,000. Um, it didn't make me very popular. Um, but as we're removing those surprises and really streamlining this process, um, one of the best things you can do to, to really break down barriers for your existing customers is lead with budget. Hey, this is what it's going to cost you to support the status quo. If you do nothing different, this is what it's going to cost. I want to make sure you're okay with that before we go layer additional security on top of that. And you'd be surprised what, what questions, comments, uh, avenues that opens up for MSPs. You know, it could be hardware as a service or leasing to, to address the big, big peaks in the budget. That, that come around every four or five years as you hit that big replacement cycle. Um, but when you do that lease, all of a sudden we flatten out the curve. There's no big, huge expenses and now cybersecurity works and we can add 300 bucks a month for some cyber products or something like that. And, and it just makes it a whole lot easier. But we're finding that um, one of the real keys to getting your customer to say yes is have including budget in your discussion. And if you're not including budget in your discussion today, I'd encourage you to, to kind of wrap your try and wrap your head around that. Think about what it might sound like. We'll talk about it again in a little bit. But um, to, to that end, Jimmy, you had you, you wanted to kind of break down cyber into. Yeah, a couple yeah. Of you know, comments. like so. So I talked a little bit about discovery and right, really being diligent about figuring out what information people want to protect. And, and, you know, this, the triad, the cybersecurity triad, something that I learned about when I first started studying cybersecurity, it's on lots of exams and tests. Um, and when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, right? So confidentiality, who can access it? Is it, you know, is, is it not just out in the wild when it's supposed to be? Is it, you know, not accessible to everyone? Um, integrity, is the information actually changed? Um, and availability, can we actually access that information when we need it to? And everything's a trade-off, right? Like a public website needs to be available all the time. It's not super confidential, but you don't want uh, the integrity of it to be changed. Um, secure information on your computer, right? It, it's super confidential. Um, you need to be able to access it on your computer. So you like, you know, add on more layers of risk, right? Cyber risk. VPN, remote desktop, things like that. So you can actually access it when you're remote and you don't want those to be changed. Um, so you add on like, you know, encryption and things like that. Um, so so everything- I always heard this consider. described as like a three-way tug of war, right? You're, you're trying to, to balance all three of these. And when one pulls, the others have to give. Exactly, exactly. Like you can't just have all of your information on an aircraft computer or on like a thumb drive in your bank, you know, like locked in a safe the deposit box. Sure, like your, your amount of like times you'd be hacked would be super low, but like you'd never be able to access the information. It wouldn't be super useful. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it, is, it is like that. But I've also found that this is a really good framework uh, or like tabletop exercise for having a conversation about cybersecurity. So like, let's say that we go um, into um, like anything that they care about, right? Like, let's say it's their credit card data. Let's say it's their HR files. Let's say it's their um, anything, right? We can, we can talk about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that information and say how we're going to protect it and sort of verbalize things. So, you know, like, um, you know, we, we you know, um, let's go through your HR files, right? You have social security numbers, Where's that information? How is it being transported? Oh, well, you know, um, we, we, we don't keep anyone's social security numbers on file. It's all done on offline in the HR office uh, and they keep it in a hard lock cabinet. Okay, so nobody's ever emailed in um, their, their new employment forms with social security numbers on it. Oh, well, um, yeah, you know, that may have happened once, you know, once in a while. Okay, all right, so you have social security numbers that are potentially in Office 365, right? So, and then it's also um, on, you know, uh, in the filing cabinet. And do you think anyone in HR possibly downloads that file to print it out on the computer? Or make a oh, photocopy yeah. of a file or something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you know, they may have done that once or twice, right? So then, you know, the, 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 that social security number information is also on the, the hard drive. Maybe they have a shared drive for printing, right? And then it's on a shared drive, it's on the email, it's in the filing cabinet. Okay, you know, now we have a lot of systems to talk about. We need to keep this information, you know, confidential. We need to keep the integrity of it uh, secure. You don't want anyone going in and changing the HR data. You don't want anyone getting into an HR system, you know, being able to change how much people are getting paid, 
Um, you don't want them downloading their, their documents, things like that. But you also need it available, but only to the HR people and maybe the CFO and the CEO or, or someone like that or auditors if they come in. Um, you know, so that's sort of like how you can have the framework. But if we go to the next, next slide, I've also found that it's very useful for talking about a tax as well. So I've been told this that the conversations around cyber have gotten much easier lately yeah. because of these big national attacks. Yep. And we're it, seeing the same thing. Yeah. And for the first time, you know, clients who have ignored cybersecurity for years are coming to MSPs and actually saying, hey, like, you know, I saw this on the news. Is this something that I need to worry <clears throat> well, about? And, and the other half of that that we're hearing is my insurance company is asking me to fill out this form, right? Yeah. And it's got 27 questions on it that I don't know how to answer. Um, can I just check yes to all of these? I assume you've got me covered. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then the MSP has to go have that conversation about, well, it would have you covered, but I tried to get your, your COO to put uh, MFA on his office 365 and he told me to go fly a kite. Um, you know, he told me it was in his way and he didn't want it on his personal phone, yada, yada. Right. So these conversations have, uh, um, yep. Uh, where we got folks in the chat saying they're seeing these exact same kind of questions. So, you know, these are, th this is good. This is progress, right? I, I want to be really clear. This makes your job easier, not having to do that fear-based selling, that slimy sales push, right? Now this becomes a, you know what? These are some things we've been trying to talk about for a couple of years. I know you weren't ready yet, but now that you are, let's go back and readdress the things we've been talking about for the last year and a half. Because, you know, we probably were there before our customers were, and that's okay. Um, at this point, like Jimmy was saying, you know, we've, we, at this point, we need to kind of unpack this, revisit it, and, and go ahead and finish up how, kind of how these three play out, though, yeah, across, well, across my, the my different types of attacks. Is you, you, like, you can get stuck in these conversations, right? And they can happen unexpectedly, and you may not be prepared for them, but you can always fall back on CIA, and you can apply it to all different areas, right? Talking about their business, uh, talking about information and in, in different places it is, but you can also use it for attacks as well. So somebody, you know, they say, you know, what happened in this attack? Each attack is maybe a combination of, you know, so exploiting some sort of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, and primarily one of the things. So like confidentiality, if someone's trying to brute force into your systems, they're trying to break the confidentiality of your systems. They're trying to get past, you know, the password. A lot of zero day exploits, you know, not all of them, they can, you know, affect other areas too, but most of them are access to, you know, systems that are supposed to be confidential. The integrity, if someone's trying to, you know, RCE, remote code execution, if someone's doing that on your system, it's changing the integrity of the files on your system. So it, it, it kind of makes it a little, like when you say zero day and RCE and man in the middle, like it's a little confusing to end users. They can't really wrap their head around what's happening. But when you just break it down to, to CIA, oh, you know, they're trying to, you know, you, you, you like to keep your information confidential, right? So they have these types of attacks called brute force, and that's how they got in. They used a brute force attack that, you know, but we can layer on other layers of protection that'll make that even more confidential. We can use, you know, multi-factor authentication. Uh, we can use uh, another layer of encryption. We can, you know, whatever it is. So you can kind of like use that framework if you ever get caught up in the meeting. I like and again, that. like availability, right? Uh, denial of service attack, DDoS attacks, right? They're, they're making it so the website's unavailable from people. Ransomware, like the great, great, great example of availability, right? The, the you know, somebody ransoms your information is like, you can't have access to it, right? So that's when you're talking about good backups or you're talking about, you know, good uh, software to protect from ransomware. You want to have your data available at all times. And if it goes down, how fast can we get it available again? And, and, um, if we, and if we kind of break these down, right, you can take these even to more plain human user English than confidentiality, integrity, availability, right? We can take this down to, um, you know, let's talk about confidentiality, Mr. Customer. If you took the data that's in your sensitive systems and posted it on a billboard on the side of the road, <laughs> what would be the impact on your business, right? Integrity. If I took your checkbook and changed all the numbers in it because some money got wired out, what would be the impact to your business? If I took your key line of business app, that website that drives all the money offline, and you couldn't ring your cash register anymore, what would be the impact on the business? So we can take each of those another step down and, and think about that depending on who you're talking to, right? Know your audience. And that's, Jimmy was saying, you know, you got to prepare for these meetings. Part of preparing for these meetings is preparing for who you're going in front of. Um, you know, you can talk 
at a fairly high nerd level if you have a, a co-managed IT so solution where you're in there talking to another IT person. Um, you really, you tone it down for your younger techier execs who kind of understand some of this and you tone it down yet further when you get into the, the, the folks who are less and less technology savvy but are getting nudged by the insurance company and forced to come your direction, even though they don't understand it and they're still kind of afraid of it. I love that. I'm, I'm stealing that for sure. <laughs> you don't have to steal it. You can borrow it at will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I tell everybody nothing new has been invented in sales in at least the last 200 years. So, uh, you know, we're just all borrowing from somebody else at this point. Yeah. I've got a perpetual license. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, that's the, my favorite is the confidentiality one, which is basically if we took the information that's in your most critical systems and put it on a billboard, what would that do to your business? And I've had customers look back at me and go, eh, we'd be fine. We'd be a little embarrassed, but we'd be fine. And I've had other customers go, we'd be out of business in 48 hours, closed, done, gone. Um, yeah. and, and how they react to that really speaks to their, uh, their level of interest in addressing cybersecurity and certainly to their level of, of maturity around, yeah. around you know, being prepared. And it's, it's kind of, it goes back to that discovery again, because those people that you say, oh, we'd be fine. Then you go, well, you know, it, you're, you know, you're a law firm, right? <laughs> well, I, it was, it was actually a machine shop that sent it to me and they said, hey, all they're going to get is uh, mailing labels to all the customers that we, that and maybe our QuickBooks data file, but they, they literally built the metal strapping that goes around pallets. Yeah. And they're like, there's nothing there. Like, we it's don't like, have well, any. Well, well, how would your customers feel if they printed all of, uh, you know, they're <laughs> embarrassed, you know, and that's what they said. We'd be embarrassed and that'd be about it. Uh, so there are customers who have a fair pushback on that. Most of the time they'll push back on you and they're wrong. And that's where Jimmy's saying, you got to dig in a little deeper. I only had that one customer ever who pushed back on me and I went, damn, I think he's right. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't pick that one apart, but, um, but let's take a second. Yeah. and step back and look at risk assessments. Because for those of you who don't know Lifecycle Insights, one of the components that we do is a risk assessment uh, a risk assessment for your clients. What you see on that slide is just a small piece of a comparison assessment. So on the left-hand side, you see status quo. This is what the environment looks like today. On the right-hand side, you see, if you followed some of my recommendations, this is where we'd be able to move the needle for you. And in this particular case, we're not moving the needle all the way. We're leaving some stuff out here in, uh, in to be done, right? We don't, Rome didn't get built in a day. Everybody adds layers as we go. Um, but this customer is going to improve at least their level one foundational cybersecurity stuff uh, by about 6% by taking on some recommendations. This is part of the conversation with your customer, right? Are we okay being, you know, being to a point where at one point we we're following 70% of the best practices, moving to a point where we're following 75 or 78 and continuous improvement, knowing one day we're going to get to 90? Or do we want to get out the checkbook, write a big fat check and get there tomorrow? Is the insurance company mandating that we get out the checkbook and write a big fat check? But my big thing about risk assessments, more than using them as a sales tool, is that we use them as a tool to kind of ground your customer and really give them visibility, transparency and visibility into where they are today. Because most of your customers don't really know. And I think the real benefit of the risk assessment is that your customer gets to see, hey, this is what my environment looks like today. If I've done, if I do nothing else, if I do nothing different. And I think it's our responsibility to kind of transparently go to our customer and show them what the status quo looks like and, and what better would look like. It's you were talking about insurance too earlier when they go and turn around, hey, am I doing these things? You go, Well, I sent you this risk assessment six months ago. Right. And I've sent you four of them over the last two years. And yeah, yeah. these questions have always been a no, not yet. <laughs> you, you kept trying to tell me you didn't need it. I kept marking it red. You kept getting mad about it. Remember that? Um, yeah, there's a lot of time to have those conversations. But, um, but if you haven't been doing risk assessments, now is the time to start. Our platform or somebody else's, I don't care. You need to let your customers know what the status quo looks like. Um, we're going to be releasing an assessment um, that's about 35 questions. That is the most common 35 questions that insurance companies are putting on their uh, on their questionnaires so that you can be ahead of those. You can run through with your customers and answer these 35 questions um, ahead, of, ahead of them getting the insurance uh, audit so that you can say, hey, you're probably going to get asked these at some point by your insurance company. One of your customers will say, well, I don't have an insurance company. You, should, you can have a different conversation with them than the ones who are saying, well, yeah, my insurance is starting to poke around and ask questions about this. I didn't know I needed to bring it to your attention. I thought you had me covered. I just checked all the boxes agreed and sent it back, right? Um, so th this really, I think, sets, for, sets the status quo, lets us know where we start. Um, <clears throat> you got anything more for that, Jimmy, or should I jump in and kind of 
let everybody see a quick 30 seconds. No, no, uh, let's, let's jump in. Let's yeah, jump let's in. jump in. I'm gonna, so I'm going to show you guys. Can you see my Lifecycle Insights dashboard here? Did that jump up there correctly or no? Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Good. That means I got it right. Um, better lucky than good. All right. So Lifecycle Insights, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, the platform was built with the core goal of helping you automate and speed up the QBR process. So I'm going to dive in. I'm going to try and spend six minutes to doing what we do in 45 minutes in a demo. So uh, we will move fast. Feel free to ask questions. We'll stay around afterwards as long as you guys want, or uh, at least for a little bit afterwards, make sure you guys get all your questions answered. But Lifecycle Insight starts with the premise that if you have to do it twice, automate it. Well, you can't automate if you don't have data. So we go to your sources of truth for data in this, in, in this sample environment. We're going to IT Glue and ConnectWise Manage. We're pulling over customers, contacts, and assets out of IT Glue, um, out of, out of uh, the, the PSA integration. In this case, ConnectWise Manage, we're getting contracts and tickets. Um, there could be a case where you only have a PSA, you don't have IT Glue, that's fine. We just get all of this data out of that tool. We work with IT Glue, ConnectWise Manage, Data Auto Task. Um, Halo PSA and Synchro. So those are five critical systems that we can plug into and pull data. Once we start to pull that data, we'll supplement users that are pulled that are pulled over up here, customers, we'll supplement their data with data that we pull from Microsoft 365. So we take a few critical data points, what's their license, what's the last time they logged in, um, and, and we'll supplement that data with Microsoft 365 data. LionGuard gives us additional key pieces of data. Are you supporting a bunch of Chromebooks? We can go get inventories of Chromebooks from LionGuard. We can get Azure AD MFA status. So uh, here's that chief operating officer who wouldn't let me put MFA on his phone. We can call that out on a report. And Breach Secure Now gives us additional data points. Um, who's the user that clicks on all the things in the, uh, in the phishing emails, right? Um, who's the user that doesn't bother to take their security awareness training? We can tie all of these user-related things together into a single user report that we can go over at a quarterly business review. So we kind of have a one, one conversation with our customer without having to print reports out of three different systems and, and cobble it all together. Um, and then on the back end, we do warranty lookups for Dell, HP, Lenovo, and Microsoft Surface, Cisco Meraki, and Cisco SmartNet. So a lot of folks are replacing other products that they use for that um, with, with Lifecycle Insights because it's just baked in to the QBR platform, right? It's baked into what we're doing for all of our other customers. That's great. So go, go ahead, Jimmy. No, no, I was saying that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 you know, it would start off as hey, let's go do a bunch of stuff. And then my developer went, people do what to how to, to, to look up warranties? That should be free. Let's just throw it in there. So you can blame my developers for that one. Um, so then once we know this data, we go take a workstation, for example, and we let you build some, some asset type policies around it. So now I say every workstation, which I've gone out and looked up its purchase date and its warranty expiration date from the vendor, I know when it was purchased. 60, day, 60 months from its purchase date, I'm going to mark it end of life. And I'm going to apply $1,000 to a budget for your customer to replace it. No more trying to figure out when to replace what and how much. It's all automated for you right here. You'll make your best practices known to your customers. Hey, I think you should keep your computers for four years, maybe five. All right, I, I think you should keep them for five. My customer pushes back and says, oh, you know what? I want to keep them for 66 months, right? I want to keep them for five and a half years. There's no way I can do five. Let's say my customer gives me some real random and, and wacky number. They want to keep them for five and a quarter years. No problem. I just rebuilt that customer's entire budget off of five and a quarter years. Imagine how long that would take you to do in Excel. And so what we tell everybody is there's nothing that we do that you, you can't do in Excel. We just do it faster. So once we know all of that information, obviously we put it in an asset list where we can tell you um, by asset type, you know, here's your workstations and you've got 11 of them that are, that are past due. Uh, some network equipment, you've got six pieces of network equipment here that's past due. We kind of show you the status of all of them. We show them to you in red, yellow, and green. You can do all kinds of neat little swatches like show me assets that are not end of life, but that maybe have a warranty that's expired. Um, that's uh, about to expire. So all these yellow ones are a warranty that's about to expire. These might be worth a warranty renewal and we can swatch and filter and, and sort this data a bunch of different ways. Any way you can sort it, we can spit it out to a Word doc or an Excel doc and we can even email it to your customer for you. You can set up scheduled emails here to make sure that this shows up in your customer's mailbox the first of every month, et cetera. So pretty basic asset list. We do the same thing with a user list. It's not too exciting. There's not too much to talk about here, but remember when I told you we're gonna pull together data points from a bunch of different platforms? Well, I know that Tom Lockhart exists. He works in the warehouse. ConnectWise told me that. B2 
PSN told me he scored a 444 on his last uh, on his last employee security test, and that his phishing fail rate is 11%. So he clicks on one of nine emails that we send through to him, right? He's not so much of my concern maybe as Patty Morrow, because he just made one mistake, she's made two. Um, and I'm probably going to find out if I put some lying guard data in there that she's the one that pushes back to me and won't let me put MFA on there. But what I can see without lying guard is that, hey, I've got a Microsoft license associated with this person, and here's the last time that they logged in. In a real world, most of these are going to be green, and we'll pop one or two of them red for you. When you're thinking about Microsoft new commerce experience, imagine having this report with everything in red that you need to cancel in that little 72 hour window that Microsoft gives you to get rid of your licenses. Kind of a hot topic today, and everybody's paying attention to it. So. That's a quick and dirty um, user list. Every cybersecurity framework, know who and what you support and make sure that you're inventorying it. So we're doing that here with, it, with, this, user, with this user and asset list. We're fulfilling that basic uh, who and what do we support. Now we're moving on to a budget forecast. We're basically taking everything off that asset list and spreadsheet view is kind of easy to look at. So we'll look at a 12 month spreadsheet view budget. That's how quickly I can build out this budget for my customer. And here's all the physical assets that we're looking at servers, workstations, network equipment, and software. All the things that are assets in my ConnectWise, assets in my IT glue, I can pull all those over, I can inventory them and, and make this easy to build a budget out of. But then we go back and we add in a couple things. We add contracts and subscriptions and recommendations. Contracts and subscriptions is how we get to total cost of ownership for all of your technology. If I go to Jimmy and say, Jimmy, um, I need you to replace two servers and a workstation this year, that's gonna be $28,000, is that cool? Right. It's a way different sales pitch than if I go to Jimmy and say, hey, Jimmy, I see that uh, in April, your, your IT spend kind of peaks. It goes up to 12 grand and it has another peak over here. Um, but I need you to replace a, 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 some extra equipment or do a security project. Does it make more sense for us to do that here in June or should we push this back to November? It's a way different conversation, is it not? Much different. And I like having the when conversation, not the if conversation, because a customer who decides that they, they might want to push back on me here. If I just said, I need you to do this in April, might just come to me and say, no. But when I start to have the when conversation and I can show them, I know how much money they spend with, uh, with Verizon. I know how much money they spend with Microsoft Office 365 and MSP services. I know what they spend with the copier dude. I know what their line of business apps cost them, right? I know what, when their Salesforce renewal comes due. I can come to them and say, hey, when you've got to pay for this big Salesforce renewal is probably the wrong time for me to ask you about a server upgrade, huh? What if we held on to that for two more months and did that replacement a couple of months down the road? And then instead of being embarrassed that they don't have the money to write me a check, they can say, yeah, you know what? That would flow with my business a whole lot easier. Remember back earlier when I said our customers are proud and they don't want to admit that you know, they're competitive, they're proud of what they built. Just like all of us, man, they've had cash flow crunches. And this helps us talk through those cash flow crunches and go, is this going to create a problem for you? The other really cool thing we can do here is spread this out over five years, right? And we get a whole different look when we're looking at it over five years. In fact, one of my favorite five-year five -year budgets looks like this. The customer didn't replace stuff, so they have $115,000 in past due expenses with another roughly hundred grand to spend over the next five years. This customer bill goes from 10,000 up 300%, down 300%, up 300%. If they were trying to budget for this, it would be darn near impossible, right? Every year, it's a different number. It's really difficult to have this conversation. But at least we can be the canary in the coal mine going, hey, next year is going to suck and 2025 is going to suck. Let's be ready early. Again, we can talk about leasing. We can talk about hardware as a service. We can talk about replacing some stuff early, the importance of paying off this overdue stuff before this snowball starts to creep up on us. So we can start to be the canary in the coal mine with a long-term vision to say, hey, there's a bad year coming and you should prepare for it. Let's have a conversation about how you're going to tackle that. And it's kind of like what we're the conversation we're having about, having about cybersecurity. Here's the, here's the status quo. Here's what you're up against, right? I did my discovery. I found out where you're at. Now, what do you want to do about it? Yeah. It's, it's also it's giving away. people options yeah. versus like yes or no. And, um, and I'm here with you. I'm not just another person who's here to extract cash from you, right? Because yeah. that's what we feel like when we go, here's your IT budget. And really all it is is workstation servers and firewalls when we need to replace them. So, you know, we jump big into this total cost of ownership section. And of course, then we get recommendations and recommendations get, is where we say, hey, maybe you're not where you need to be on cybersecurity. I need you to spend a little more money. We can pack that into a recommendation and let the customer move that money throughout their budget to kind of see, play with when's the right time to do it, when's the right time to get it in your budget. So recommendations, we won't dig into that today. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, and then you get into assessments. 
in assessments, again, pretty straightforward. Um, when we dig into assessments, I'll go back to my favorite demo customer here. When we get into assessments, it's as easy as uh, we, we drill into an assessment. We run through and score it with our customer, red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, either against our best practices or against some best practices that come to us, maybe from some insurance vendors, hint, hint. Um, and we can check these boxes and say, hey, Mr. Customer, your power management may be at risk. You know, we, we, we don't have uh, that UPS is old. It's not going to do the trick. Or my favorite one when I ask people about it is, you know, when was the last time the configuration on your UPS was tested? Right. And we'll give you a lot of those questions to go ask your customer and say, hey, your battery backup's there and it's only two years old. But when's the last time we actually tested it to make sure it would work? Um, and these are the kind of things that enable you to maybe go create some more projects for your customers, get some more billable revenue out of your customer, but also help them um, really make a, a better decision where technology is concerned. And then the last part of that, of course, is Report Builder, where we pull all of this into one uh, cohesive report. It gives us an easy way to generate, uh, you know, three, four, five of these reports in a customizable order. Of course, while I'm on a demo, it's going to take forever to load. But um, it gives us the ability to put all of these in one nice cohesive report uh, where we can show the customer, hey, here's, here's the reports I want you to have. You're never going to present this much. This is a sample budget for or a sample report out of our demo platform. But it gives me the ability quickly and easily to pop this out for my customer and say, hey, here's a cover page, a meeting agenda, um, here's a security awareness, or I'm sorry, our assessment methodology, this is how and why we do what we do, um, a 12 month budget, a five year budget. We can talk through all of these reports. This presentation view takes you no time to deliver. You can import infographics from some of your, from some of your vendors. Um, if, you, if, if QuickPass has a cool infographic, we could import that and present it. Um, some of these haven't been formatted quite right. I was just playing with them to get them out there. We can do social engineering reports. We can do the Breach Secure Now integration and actually show the Breach Secure Now data to show, hey, we've had two breaches and this is what, it, what, what this puts us up against. So this gives you an easy way to present that in front of your customer. Obviously, when you're doing it real life, you're going to scale it down, present just what's important to you and your customer and is timely to you and your customer so that you don't overwhelm them. So guys, I'm not gonna take any more of your time. That's Lifecycle Insights in a nutshell. We automate all of that reporting, make it easy for you to get it out to your customer so that you can then go have a quick and simple conversation with your customer about, hey, how can we move the needle and get you from here over to here or even further to the right and you know, continue to improve that cybersecurity status. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and let Jimmy kind of pick up and Jimmy's gonna rock us through uh, through some cool stuff in QuickPass. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I actually, uh, so so real quick, QuickPass, what we do is privileged access management for MSPs. Uh, we have tools to protect you internally, uh, your own tech team uh, and your critical accounts, your privileged accounts, those accounts that might keep you up at night, those accounts that, you know, like admin access to Office 365, uh, server admin access, service accounts, um, local admin accounts. accounts. Yeah. Yeah, so we keep those secure. We rotate the passwords for them. Um, we have our own security vault. We integrate with tools MSPs use, like uh, you know PSAs. IT Glue is a big one. A lot, of, you know, we can rotate the passwords inside IT Glue, push them there automatically. So often as every single day. Uh, we also help you protect your end users. Um, we can do self-service password reset without. Um, you know, totally replacing the Microsoft self-service password reset. We can do it with an app on your phone where you can, you know, verify who they are, biometrics, reset the password. Uh, we can also identify who someone is when they're calling into your help desk. So I hear a lot of people, you know, they don't have a process or a way of knowing if the person on the other end of the phone is who they say they are. Um, so I do we have talk a about quick... that. We talk about that with our partners all the time. <laughs> and the big thing we talk about is when I get a look at, what, at their Microsoft 365 and how many clients, how many humans exist there that don't exist in ConnectWise anymore. So you yeah. hired this human, they still have a mailbox. And if they called in, you'd probably give them support, wouldn't you? And they go, well, I don't really have a process for that, but we just assume we know who left. I hear it all the time. Um, so th that's a, that's a very important one. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I actually, I had a, uh, colleague of mine um, record a little uh, overview just to get you an idea of how the system works and what's inside of it. So I will give it up to Andrew here. Hey guys, I'm here to just give you a quick high level overview of QuickPass, both, both QDesk and QGuard. Um, here you have a multi-tenant customer list, uh, really built for the channel. Uh, you have Active Directory, local machines and Office 365. Um, how we gather this information, with Active Directory, it's an agent on the DC, agent on the local machine, enterprise app on the tenant. We also act as an AD sync for you or will enhance your AD experience with, um, with the, that synchronization tool as 
we'll eliminate that lag time. So brings it down from that you know 20 minute lag time with AD sync um, to instantaneous. If you don't have AD sync set up, we will be that synchronization tool. Jumping into a customer list here. You're looking at the two products here. You have Q Desk, which is more of the end user experience with your service desk. And then you have Q Guard, so the administrative and service account password rotation. So looking at the end user experience here, here we're looking at Ace Broomfield, for example. And from QuickPass, you're able to reset passwords, verify user identity, disable accounts, all without your technician having to access the server. And the big thing for your end users here will be that ability for them to reset passwords. And again, you've got that user verification uh, before you do anything with your tickets. So here I just pulled up my cell phone. Uh, a couple ways this can happen. There's um, mobile apps for Android or Apple, uh, or it can be done through SMS or email. But first thing your technician should do before doing any work moving forward is verify that user's identity. When that happens here, so I'm just gonna refresh the page and show you how that looks. I have the mobile app on my phone, verify user identity. It's going to send a code, in this case to the mobile app or SMS or email if they don't have the mobile app on their phone. And now your end user can simply click verify user identity. It'll be a white labeled account, biometrics to get in. And there you see that verification. The end user simply clicks approve. And now your technician, user identity successfully verified. And that'll be logged in QuickPass. Once the end user is in their account um, on their mobile device, they can reset their password. So this is the self-serve password side of things or self-serve reset password. They have the policy coming from AD or 0365. They can reset the password without having to contact your service desk. That's the Q desk side of things. Now, a quick overview of Q guard, um, same idea. Very easy to do for your technicians. This is a little bit more of a set it and forget it because the technician will be able to set up that rotation policy for their privileged passwords, the time zone, when the rotation will take place, the frequency, I have it set up for once a day, and then what you want your password to look like. Now, if you're using a documentation tool, for example, like IT Glue, um, now I'm gonna just quickly do a rotation of all my administrative and all my service account passwords on a bulk basis to show you, rotate now. I have my demo account set up with IT Glue. Now I'm in IT Glue, let me refresh the screen real quick here. And we'll give it a moment here just so I can show you the revision log. There you go. March 10th, that's today for me, 9.45 AM. The QuickPass API did a rotation of that privileged password. And there's my new passphrase that's been generated directly from QuickPass. Same thing with service accounts. Now, nice thing about service accounts is it will not break the service. Um, what it'll do is it'll do that rotation after hours, as mentioned, and then it'll restart the service. So you don't have to worry about those breakages. And that's just a high level overview of kind of what we'll do. Um, the demo will show a lot more as well, of course. Um, I'll also be able to show you stuff like um, users being locked out of their accounts with the self-serve tool um, and stuff along those lines. Thanks for joining. Yeah, great. So about that. ah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a demo without or a webinar without it. So um, <laughs> does anybody have questions about privilege access management? Because I think it's something that I know for a fact not enough MSPs do. Right, we work with hundreds of them, and I see um, the results of their risk assessments and, and all the questions that get asked. Um, you know, most of us here probably, at least when I ran my MSP, we had the nightmare of giving every tech an admin account at every customer and cycling those out when they when the techs left. So does anybody have questions about that process and that product, or should we just wait and send you guys a, a video? Tell you what, I'll post right. the link, and if anybody wants to meet with us, they can. There you go, and I've got the link over here too. Great. Um, so we'll head back over here to our wrap up slide. So if you guys want to connect with QuickPass, they do have a link out here for you to schedule a demo. Um, if you use that link to schedule a demo, um, then you will get correct me, Jimmy, nine hundred up to $900 off the onboarding yes, fee? Yes, we can waive your onboarding fees. Waive your onboarding, waive your onboarding fees, onboarding. there you go. Um, and I threw Jimmy's LinkedIn up there because I know he needs more friends. 
and uh, so do I. So come follow us on LinkedIn and hang out with us there. Um, if you'd like to schedule a demo with Lifecycle Insights, you can do so at the link up there as well. Um, we've got a free trial up right now on both our core module that I showed you guys and our new customer success module, which helps you identify um, some pretty cool um, uh, opportunities that might exist in your existing client base. We'll show you where your clients are out of, out of alignment with your product stack and things like that. So uh, a lot of cool things we can do with that new customer success module. So anything else you want to say in closing there, Jimmy, or do we give these people eight minutes back in their day? Yeah, I think we should give them some time back. I, right. I'm going to go sit in a corner uh, and cry because my, <laughs> um, demo didn't no, work. No, there's no crying in baseball or in, or in account management. It's just not a thing. Um, <clears throat> so for that, um, you know, Jimmy said next time he's at an event, he will buy each of you a beer. That's what Yes, he, that's what yes. And, uh, all right. Well, with that, you guys, I, I know I've never met an MSP who had an extra ticket they could close if they had eight minutes. So um, with that, uh, we'll let you guys get back to work. Thanks for joining us today. It was fun. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care. Take care.